Would you please turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 16, 16th Psalm. And I'd like to read for you the uh, 11 verses of the psalm, but just to remind you, we're looking at the same text that we looked at last week, which is verse 11. This is a psalm of David. David writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no good beside you. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their libations of blood, nor shall I take their names upon my lips. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, neither will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now last week we considered that our relationship with God is really the most satisfying thing that we will ever possess either in this life or in the life which is to come. Now I know that we might be tempted to think and often we are tempted to think that the things of the world will really make us happy. But we need to remember the lesson that God taught us through Solomon who had everything that the world had to offer. He had anything or everything that anyone could possibly ever want. And he had a great deal of it. But these things did not make him happy. Only God can make us happy. It doesn't matter who in this world or what in this world it is that you want. It won't satisfy you. Sooner or later you will grow tired of it and to begin to look to something else to fill the gap that it leaves behind. You know how exciting things are when they're new. The newness wears off. But that won't happen with God. You will never stop enjoying Him. The newness will never wear off because God is infinite. Now we also began to look at what God gives us in this world that is so satisfying. We talked about it as those uh, bits and smatterings, those drippings of heaven as it were. It really has to do with the Holy Spirit in our hearts. God gives himself to us in a personal relationship by putting his spirit within our hearts, by reversing the effects of the fall that caused us really to hate God when we when we should love him. And instead of hating God we begin to love him and in that love we embrace him through the Lord Jesus Christ and now in this new relationship that we have with God through Christ we become truly satisfied. And again, we we likened it to the relationship that we have with people in this world. I mean, I think one of the most enjoyable things that we have in this life are the relationships that we have with one another. Well, this relationship with God is like that, only infinitely more so. I mean, really, what can be greater? What is a greater pleasure than experiencing the love of a good friend or the love of a parent? or the love of a spouse, or to have your children uh, love you in return for all the love that you have given to them. Perhaps we think that these are the greatest uh, kinds of pleasure and joy that we're going to be able to experience in, in life, in, in our existence here or in the, the uh, world to come, but we're wrong. The pleasure of a relationship with God is greater in the same measure that his love is greater. His love is infinite and so infinitely more satisfying. But what we have here is only a foretaste of what we're going to actually receive in heaven because in heaven that joy and that love is there in all of its fullness and it lasts 
forever. Now it's this fullness of joy and happiness that is in heaven that I want us to consider this morning. You know, I was trying to think about why it is that this particular generation, this particular culture, and it's really universal, I think. Why is it that we think so little of heaven? Why is it that we don't dwell on it more than we do? Well, I think it's because of the kind of world that we live in. I mean, after all, of all the generations who have ever lived in this world and of all the different countries that have had the things that people have to enjoy, I think we have more things here to enjoy than just about any other people at any other time in history. There are so many fun things for us to do. I mean, just look at your uh, children as they spend time on the computer and see if, if these things, these joys, these, these things that we have to do aren't addicting. We have them for ourselves as well. Each of us has those things that we enjoy doing and they are so much fun that sometimes they, they take our attention off of heaven, perhaps all the time they do, and we don't really seem to start thinking about it until we reach the end of our lives when we know that we're about to be forced to let go of the world. Then we begin thinking about heaven. Well, these things were not true in the years past. As a matter of fact, back then, say back three centuries ago in the 1700s, when all you had to look forward to was a few years, when the life expectancy was about 30, and for those 30 years, you had to work as hard as you could in order to make a living, and then you could expect to die probably a very painful death from some kind of illness, something that would take your life. You thought a lot about heaven. I think this is one of the reasons why the uh, uh, framers of the Shorter Catechism, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, uh, deal with <clears throat> the joy that we can have here and that joy that is to come in the hereafter in the very first question of the Catechism. They ask the question, what is the chief end of man? And they answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. I know we focus a lot on glorifying God, but the reason why we do is because it is a means to an end. We will not enjoy God unless we glorify Him. That is the path that leads there. Now we've already seen something of what it means to enjoy God in this life. That Again, that relationship that we have with Him here that foretaste of glory that God gives to us by His Holy Spirit. But what does it mean to enjoy Him in the hereafter? Well, Thomas Vincent, in his Family Instructional Guide, which is actually quite a helpful book, that takes the shorter catechism and breaks down the questions and answers into more questions and answers, asks uh, basically, well, he asks the question, what does it mean to enjoy God in heaven? He writes this, God will be enjoyed hereafter by His people, when they shall be admitted into his glorious presence, have an immediate sight of his face and full sense of his love in heaven, and there fully and eternally acquiesce and rest in him with perfect and inconceivable delight and joy. Notice he says, he talks about this idea of fullness. He talks about this idea of God as the one who gives to us this fullness of joy. But he also recognizes that it is eternal and it is something that is inconceivable. We only know a little bit about it now because of that foretaste of glory. But what is waiting for us in heaven is greater than we can really understand. And this is exactly what our text is talking about this morning when it says in verse 11, In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. This morning I want us to look forward to this world that is full of joy, this world full of love. Now, one thing that is true is that we really, as I've already mentioned, cannot conceive of the pleasure that we are going to enjoy in heaven. We can't know exactly what it's going to be like, but certainly we know that there are some, there are, we know some things about it. And we know it's certainly going to be a lot better than what we experience here and even better than the best things that we experience here. Now there are some things that we won't fully understand until we get there. For instance, um, in the intermediate state, you know, we've never experienced what it's like to be disembodied spirits. 
We have experienced life, we've experienced all the pleasures that we've experienced so far in our bodies. And oftentimes when we experience something that is you know, pleasurable, it's, that uh, brings us joy and happiness, there is also a physical response that comes from our nervous system. You know? We don't know what it's like to experience those joys and those delights that are in heaven in our spirits only, or only within our soul. But we do know that they are real, and we do know that they are better than what we experience here. It is better to depart and to be with Christ than to remain on in the flesh. We also don't know what it's like to have a glorified body. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ raises us on the last day after we've been with him for however long it is between the time we die and the time he comes again, he's going to raise our bodies and glorify our bodies and reunite us with our bodies. And then we are going to live in his presence in a different kind of body. One that is spiritual, one that is changed in some way. We don't know what it's like to experience those joys and those pleasures in glorified bodies. So as I've said, there are certain things we don't really know, certain things we can't conceive, but we do know this, that it's going to be a lot better than what we're experiencing now. As again, Paul reminds us, and as he knew, he desired to leave this body and to be at home with the Lord. Now there are a number of mysteries surrounding heaven, but there is one thing that isn't a mystery, and that is in heaven we will enjoy it because God is there. He's of course everywhere, but in heaven he does reveal himself in a particularly uh, blessed way. And our Lord Jesus Christ will be there. And for the Christian, that is what makes heaven to be heaven. It's not because, again, of some idea of streets paved with gold. Oh, gold, you know, gold's so precious. I love gold. I can't wait to see a golden city and to have all those riches. Well, you're going to be disappointed because that's not the way heaven is. I think that's symbolic language. And even if God had created a city that's 1,500 mile cube golden city, you wouldn't care a bit about that city. All you would care about is seeing the Lord. Remember, the most satisfying and pleasurable thing that you will ever experience in your existence is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And there, it will be much greater than it is here. Now, I wanted to uh, read a couple of thoughts about this from some authors uh, of long ago who seem to be able to focus on these things perhaps more accurately and clearly than we can. Again, because we live in spiritual Disneyland, I guess, or we live in, in physical Disneyland, and the people who live before us experience so much hardship, they focus quite a bit on heaven. But this is what J.C. Ryle, again, the, uh, the Anglican bishop who lived contemporaneously with uh, Spurgeon, and in the 19th century, not the 18th century, in the 1800s, he wrote this. I cannot describe what kind of place paradise is because I cannot understand the condition of a soul separate from the body. But I ask no brighter view of paradise than this, that Christ is there. All other things in the picture which imagination draws of the state between death and resurrection are nothing in comparison of this. How he is there and in what way he is there, I know not. Let me only see Christ in paradise with my eyes when, when my eyes close in death, and that is enough. Well does the psalmist say, in your presence is fullness of joy. It was a true saying of a dying girl when her mother tried to comfort her by describing what paradise would be. There, she said to the child, there you will have no pains and no sickness. There you will see your brothers and sisters who have gone before you and will be always happy. Ah, mother, was the reply, but there is one thing better than all, and that is Christ will be there. Now, if the child actually said that and meant that, then that child actually was going to be in heaven because that is the mark of a true believer, the desire to depart and to be with Christ. Christ, and of course the Father as well, that would make heaven to be heaven. That's what we're looking forward to. Now, because Christ, who is our greatest joy and our greatest pleasure in this life, is going to be there, then obviously when we leave this world to go there, we're not going to miss the things that we have to leave behind. Sometimes we think, I don't want to leave behind the relationships that I have here. I, I, I mean, I, I do enjoy them. 
Uh, I love my wife. I love my children. I love my friends. I love the body of Christ. Uh, I don't want to leave. Thomas Watson reminds us that no matter what we have to leave here, we're not going to be sad that we did because the fullness of joy and of relationship with Christ is in heaven and it overshadows all the others. This is what he writes. When a man comes to the sea, he doesn't complain that he lacks his cistern of water. Though you drew comfort from your relations, yet when you come to the ocean and are with Christ, you shall never complain that you have left your cistern behind. There will be nothing that brings sorrow in heaven. There shall be joy and nothing but joy. Heaven is, is described, set out by these words, enter into the joy of your Lord. Here joy enters into us, there we enter into joy. The joys we have here are from heaven. The joys that we shall have with Christ are without measure and without mixture. In your presence is fullness of joy. So we won't miss what's, what we're leaving behind because of what it is we'll actually be gaining. And if we actually, if we believe that, then we'll want to be there. Now we also know about heaven that the joy that we're going to receive there is going to last forever. How could we have complete satisfaction and complete happiness unless we had a happiness that never comes to an end? It doesn't matter how great it is, if it, if it ends at some particular point, then obviously the satisfaction it brings is going to end as well. But heaven is a place with a joy that lasts forever because the God who promises to give it to us is eternal. Again, listen to J.C. Ryle. He writes this, Let us settle it then in our minds, for one thing, that the future happiness of those who are saved is eternal. However little we may understand it, it is something that will have no end. It will never cease, never grow old, never decay, and never die. God will fill us with joy in His presence with eternal pleasures at His right hand. Once they arrive in paradise, the saints of God will never, ever leave that wonderful place. Their inheritance can never perish, spoil, or fade. They will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Their warfare is finished. Their fight is over. Their work is done. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. They are traveling on towards an eternal glory that far outweighs all their struggles, toward a home which will never be broken up, a meeting without a parting, a family gathering without a separation, a day without night. Faith will be swallowed up in sight and hope in certainty. They will see as they have been seen and know as they have been known and be with the Lord forever. I am not surprised that the Apostle Paul adds, encourage each other with these words. And Thomas Brooks writes this, Mark for quality, there are pleasures. For quantity, fullness. For dignity, at God's right hand. For eternity, forevermore. And millions of years multiplied by millions do not make up one minute to this eternity of joy that the saints shall have in heaven. In heaven there shall be no sin to take away your joy, nor no devil to take away your joy, nor no man to take away your joy. Your joy no man takes from you. The joy of the saints in heaven is never ebbing, but always flowing to all contentment. The joys of heaven never fade, never wither, never die, nor never are lessened nor interrupted. The joy of the saints in heaven is a constant joy, an everlasting joy in the root and in the cause and in the matter of it and in the objects of it. Their joy lasts forever whose objects remain forever. And so again, because the Lord will never cease to be, because Christ will never cease to be, and because He has promised to keep us in heaven, and we will never cease to be, we will enjoy these things forever. But again, let's not forget what we saw last week, and that is that if we are to enjoy the real things there are to enjoy in heaven, which of course is God and the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to enjoy them here. Again, Ryle writes this as a challenge to those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It may be you do not think much about your soul. It may be you know little of Christ as your Savior and have never tasted by experience that He is precious. And yet perhaps you hope to go to paradise when you die. Surely this passage is one that should make you think paradise is a place where Christ is. Then can it be a place that you would enjoy? I think this, this almost sounds like it comes from that track, suppose an unrighteous man went to heaven. There's really nothing there the unrighteous would enjoy because the joy of the saints is Christ and the unrighteous do not enjoy Him. You must enjoy Christ here if you are to enjoy Christ in heaven. Let me just remind you again of those questions Ryle asked us last week that help us to know whether or not we really enjoy Christ here. He says this, Do you think about Christ often? Do you like to hear about Christ? Do you like to read about Him? Do you like to please Him? Do you like His friends, His people? Are you jealous of His name and honor? Do you enjoy speaking with Him? Do you enjoy spending time with Him? Obviously, if you can answer yes to each of those questions, you really do love Him. And you will be with Him, and heaven will be everything that we've talked about to you. But if you really don't enjoy Him here, you will not enjoy Him there because you do not love Him. And if this is the case, you need to ask the Lord to give you that love and keep asking the Lord until He puts that love in your heart. That is what makes heaven to be heaven for the believer. Now before we close the subject, let's just consider again a couple of things that flow from the fact that heaven is real and that it promises a much greater joy and happiness than anything that we can experience here. The first thing that we need to see is this, we need to stop looking for our happiness here. That's been the application uh, in a number of the sermons of late. As long as we look for our happiness here, we're going to be disappointed. As long as we look for our happiness here, we're, we're not going to be looking for it in the place the Lord has called us to look for it. Now, we should be thankful for what the Lord does give us here, for the joy, for the pleasure He gives us in this life, for the relationships that He gives us, for the things that He gives us, for our relationship with Him that we have in some measure here. But we do need to remember the lesson that the Lord is teaching us through the various trials that He sends into our lives, the, the flies in the ointment, the, the, uh, again, the joy that's mixed with a certain measure of sorrows and so forth, He is reminding us that we are not to look for our full happiness here. We are to look for our happiness in heaven. And remember, too, that the best that the world has to offer is only fleeting at best. What God gives us is eternal, which is why we need to be looking there. Watson, Thomas Watson reminds us of that when he says this, Worldly joys are soon gone, such as crown themselves with rosebuds and bathe in the perfumed waters of pleasures, may have joys which seem to be sweet, but they are swift. They are like meteors which give a bright and sudden flash and then disappear. But the joys which believers have are abiding. They are a blossom of eternity, a pledge of those rivers of pleasure which run at God's right hand. As long as you continue to look for your happiness in, in this world and in the things of the world and not in God, you are never going to be satisfied. Only God can satisfy you. So stop trying to find your ultimate happiness here. You're not going to find it. Look for it in Christ. Secondly, if we really love God and we're convinced that when we die that we will go to be with Him and that we're going to be far happier there than we are here, then we should not be afraid to die. Rather, we should actually look forward to it. Even as the Apostle Paul, whom we read in Philippians chapter 1, to depart and to be with Christ is very much better. Let me read to you just an extended passage by Thomas Brooks. I think he puts it as, as best as anyone can put it. This is what he writes. If God is a believer's portion, then never let a believer be afraid to die or unwilling to die. Let those be afraid to die who have only this world for their portion here and hell for their portion hereafter. But let not a saint be afraid of death who has the Lord of life for his portion. A man who has God for his portion should rather invite death than tremble at it. 
He should rather sweetly welcome it than turn his back upon it. For death to such a one is but the way to paradise, the way to all heavenly delights, the way to those everlasting springs of pleasure which are at God's right hand, the way to life, immortality, and glory, and the way to a clear, full, constant, and eternal enjoyment of God. Augustine, upon these words, you cannot see my face and live, makes this short but sweet reply. Then, Lord, let me die, that I may see your face. Death is the bridge which leads to the paradise of God. All the hurt that it can do is to bring a believer to a full enjoyment of God, his everlasting portion. When Modestus, the emperor's lieutenant, threatened to kill Basil, he answered, If that be all, I fear not. Yes, your master cannot more pleasure me than in sending me unto my heavenly Father, to whom I now live and to whom I desire to hasten. Old Alderman Jordan used to say that death would be the best friend he had in the world and that he would willingly go forth to meet it, or rather say with holy Paul, O death, where is your sting triumphing over, uh, triumphing over it? What is a drop of vinegar put into an ocean of wine? What is it for one to have a rainy day who is going to take possession of a kingdom? A Dutch martyr, feeling the flame come to his beard, Ah, said he, what a small pain is this to be compared to the glory to come. Lactantius boasts of the braveness of that spirit which was upon the martyrs in his time. Our children and women, not to speak of men, he says, do in silence overcome their tormentors, and the fire cannot so much as fetch a sigh from them. John Noyes took up a stick at the fire and kissed it, saying, Bless be the time that ever I was born to come to this preferment. Never did a neckerchief fit me so well as this chain, said Alice Driver, when they fastened her to the stake to be burnt. Mr. Bradford took off his cap and thanked God when the keeper's wife brought him word that he was to be burnt on the morrow. John Rogers, the first who was burnt in Queen Mary's days, sang in the flames. Be of good cheer, said the woman martyr to her husband that was to suffer with her, for though we have but an ill dinner on earth, we shall sup with Christ in heaven. And what, said Justin Martyr to his murderers, in behalf of himself and his fellow martyrs, you may kill us, but you can never hurt us. Ah, Christians, how can you read over these choice instances and not blush and not be ashamed to consider what a readiness, what a forwardness, and what a noble willingness there was in those brave worthies to die and go to heaven and to be fully possessed of their God, of their portion, while you shrug at the very thoughts of death and frequently put that day far from you and had rather with Peter fall upon building of tabernacles than with Paul desire to be dissolved and to be with Christ. O oh, Christians, how justly may that father be angry with his child that is unwilling to come home. And how justly may that husband dis be displeased with his wife who is unwilling to ride to him in a rainy day or to cross the sea to enjoy his company. And is not this your case? Is not this just your case who have God for your portion and yet are unwilling to die that you may come to a full enjoyment of your portion? I think those are very uh, searching words. Do we love the Lord enough to want to leave this world and to be with Him? Or are we so much in love with this world and so resistant to go with Him that we're afraid of death? You realize, of course, that if we can embrace what He is saying here and actually desire to be with the Lord, that death will no longer hold any fear for us at all, no terror for us, and it may actually remove some of the roadblocks that keep us from doing the things that we might like to do for the Lord, but we're afraid to do because we're afraid it might, we might get hurt we're afraid of the repercussions. We're afraid that we might actually die. Well, if we actually look forward to death, then we wouldn't be afraid to die. And that is how heaven really comes home to us. Do we really believe it? Do we really believe it exists? Do we really believe that there is joy there greater than what we experience here? Do we really believe that heaven belongs to us through the Lord Jesus Christ? If so, then we should not be afraid to die. Well, let's, uh, let's close here. Let's spend a few moments and ask the Lord to help us search our own hearts 
and to learn from these examples and to be able to grow in grace to reach the point where we actually can say with the martyrs, we can say with the Apostle Paul, to leave this world and to be with the Lord Jesus Christ is very much better. Let's spend a few moments in prayer.